gentlemen, welcome to the future. My name is Zach Gardner. I'm the chief architect at Keyhole Software. And about three to four months ago, I set off on a little bit of a journey. I wanted to find people that had strong opinions one way or the other about generative AI. It's such a new field. It's such a new trend that I felt I needed to get up to speed with it. So I did what most people do. These days I went out and I found people that have strong opinions, you know, maybe for, maybe as well as against, to help give me a really rounded picture on what it is that I need to be thinking of, what are some of the good use cases of it, and what are some of the things that maybe I'm not thinking of, or maybe things that I see people talking about, maybe I see people not talking about it. So with me today is Chris Cantu, the Director of UI Engineering at Procore, First met him in, oh God, what was it? The React Austin user group, maybe last year. And there was like a ice storm or something, you know, small world, man. How's it going? It's going well. How are you doing? Not too bad. Not too bad. So uh, my, my disclaimer that I always start this off with, all the views and opinions expressed in this program are the views and opinions of its participants do not reflect their employers or any trade organizations that they're affiliated with. And with that said... I mean, to get us started off, Chris, kind of talk to me about your career journey. You know, how did you get into programming? Do you remember the very first program that you wrote? And how did you go from, you know, just a, a JavaScript developer, maybe up to the director of UI engineering? Let's start there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, got, I spent a long time, obviously, due to the grades, you can see that. Um, I started uh, software development really in high school or junior high even, I'm uh, doing languages like QBasic and TurboBasic, if you want to be really old school. Um, went through college, I uh, got an IS degree, and um, just started really getting into programming uh, in my work. Um, and then just kind of made my way through different careers. Tried to stay mostly focused on the front end. I just really enjoyed either middle tier and frontier type uh, engineering work. And uh, worked at a long time at Rackspace, where I got exposed to a lot of different languages and technologies, um, working in Groovy uh, and Groovy on Grails, Grails. And then uh, picked up, was one of the first adopters uh, of Angular at Rackspace, uh, built out an entire program there, went, going from <clears throat> where I led a team, we went from four engineers to eight teams in the course of uh, about a year and a half, two years maybe. Uh, and that was a really great ride. Um, yeah, and then I moved over into leadership because I, I found that all the, the really hard problems are actually more personal, personal, organizational. And I wanted to I wanted to get in there and do that stuff, but stay close to the technology. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, yeah, and I've, I've worked pretty much all throughout the stack in my career, um, focusing on um, site reliability engineering, GraphQL uh, administration for large scale sites, as well as mobile engineering, mostly React Native. Mm -hmm. And then I made my way to Procore. That's about it. Yeah, very cool. GraphQL, we should, I should have a whole video cast series on that. That's one of my favorite topics to evangelize on for those that haven't used it. So the now, let, let's turn more towards the generative AI angle. Kind of what, what's been your experience with generative AI? How have you seen it maybe supplement or augment things that we as programmers do on a day-to-day -day basis, and how are you seeing it being effectively woven into the software development lifecycle? Could you talk a little bit through that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's been a journey, to be honest. I think those of us who've been in software engineering for a long time, we have our habits already established. So that is a, a very much a disruption to how we work today, right? Instead of writing code and sitting down and just authoring something, you have to think, um, more practical and then closer to like BDD style development. You have to ask questions, right? You have to give it information so that it can provide a clear answer. And, and that's a different style, right? That's a completely different mental model of interacting. Where I've seen it most helpful is at least in, in my experience with junior developers who haven't developed those hard grain methodologies of working, right? So they're more open <clears throat> to development and it gets them up to speed better and it introduces a lots of new patterns uh, and best practices. So where I've seen it be most effective is 
helping those those people more junior in the career level up very quickly to that probably I would say mid tier level pretty fast. Yeah. I've same. I I remember, you know, probably back when you and I first started getting programming. It was just it was really hard to find good information out there. You had to scour the internet, you had to go on so many different forums and the likelihood that someone was able to answer your question was very low, much less that you would even have the know, like, the knowledge to be able to know how to type into a Google search, you know, to, to try to find what it is you were looking for. And then along came Stack Overflow, which then, in That's some ways it was good. I mean, don't get me wrong, it was like a, the consolidated hub where we all could go. But if you just copied and pasted the answer directly from Stack Overflow without actually understanding maybe what the implications of it were, maybe understanding the pros and the cons, or even understanding the context in which the author was giving that particular recommendation, you missed out and you might introduce, you know, bugs to production, which I never did. You know, I've, I've never introduced any bugs to production. Um, so I see, and I, I think this might echo your experience a little bit, how we're using generative AI for GitHub Copilot or even chat GPT just to ask it questions. It's difficult in two parts. It's difficult to know how to even phrase your question so that it can pick up what you're wanting to say and it's, it's understanding you effectively, but it's also difficult to know how to take the answer and effectively apply it. I'm curious if you've seen, you know, anything else in terms of, you know, how junior developers are using or maybe any, any recommendations that you have to junior developers for how they can maybe use it more effectively. Well, the first thing I would say is ChatGPT, just like Stack Overflow, could not replace a great mentor or mentors in your organization, right? Having someone who has that context, right? Um, you could ask the wrong question, right? You could be prompting it incorrectly and not know, right? The hard part about prompt engineering is no, knowing how to prompt it correctly for your use case. And if you don't have any prior experience, you are going to be a little bit out in the wild, right? A little lost, and that's okay. Um, and you also won't know if, if it is an, a hallucination type response if you don't have context on the response, right? If you don't understand what it's saying and why it's saying this, or maybe not the why, but you know how to apply it and why it would work or not work in your particular particular use case. So I would say it helps you get that first level up on the most basic fundamentals. But as you get more and more entrenched into solar engineering, it's all about nuance, right? I like to tell my engineers, right? There's no perfect solution. It's all about trade-offs, right? And which trade-off is the right one for your use case. Making that leap, I think is really, really hard without someone who is an expert who can give can fill in the blanks and say, okay, I see that you found this. Uh, th this is how I would talk to engineers about Stack Overflow specifically. Uh, that's why I was smiling. You know, like, I, I see you found this answer on Stack Overflow. Tell me why this is the right approach for this, right? Like, this might be the right approach for them, but for our problem, help me explain that gap, right? And just because there is an answer doesn't mean it's the right answer. Mm -hmm. No, getting getting context is great. One of the ways that I've actually found it to be, there's probably <laughs> two different ways that I personally have found it to be useful. One of which is that if I just have no idea what something is called, I can describe it and I don't have to go through and click through, you know, two or three or four different Google searches and then accept someone's cookie policy and then accept someone's, <laughs> you know, ads and then scroll through and then get their whole life story about how they traveled abroad to France and then get the answer. It's like I, I can get everything in a text-based format. And I can also use it to be able to do things that I just don't remember how to do well. Like for whatever reason, regular expressions do not stick in my brain. And I Same. always have to go back to the regular expression cheat sheet, and then I'll have to have a regular expression tester. And then, you know, 10, 15 minutes later, I'll have something working. Whereas I've ran into a few situations where I could just describe what I wanted. And I'll say, write me a regular expression for this. And it gets probably 70, 80, 90% of the way yeah, there it, yeah. in a much shorter time than I could have. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think what that all too often engineers try to focus on the coding aspect, right? Before fully understanding a problem. And what I like about ChatGPT and, and, and Copilot and these types of technologies, when you're trying to use it for coding, you have to fully understand the problem if you're going to get a right answer. But to add to your point, where I think Copilot and these technologies can really help is with helping engineers be lazy. And, and what I mean by that, great engineer engineering teams today are, are fairly disciplined, right? They write good documentation, they write great unit tests and and end-to-end -end tests, and maybe they do snapshot testing or whatnot. Uh, and that's and additionally, they have great metrics that they monitor in production and understand. But that requires a great deal of discipline and focus from the team to do that while trying to create a great product, right? And, and that's rare. And what I think Copilot can really offer, right, is um, like we spent, when I was at Verbo, we spent probably a month tuning our alerts and trying to figure out where that sweet spot was. Whereas something like machine learning can apply, okay, all I really care about is when there's a, str uh, a strong deviation, right? And that's gonna yield to bad results. Well, that doesn't require uh, an engineer to do that. You can, you, can, you can automate that process, right? Or documentation, right? How, how many engineers love writing documentation? where you can use something, <clears throat> especially like uh, PypeScript docs or JavaScript docs, where you can just ask it to write a, a pretty easy prompt and, and get a good description of the function that you're, you're building right there. So I think all of that is very, very helpful and helping us be lazy because, and then focus more on the right things, which is adding, adding business value, right? Writing new product features and ensuring that the product is consistent Right. Because that when you have a long running project, right, that most projects now run for years and years before you're ever thinking about rewriting them. You have to have consistency or documentation for why a decision was made. You have to have um, the standard pattern built out if it's going to be a stable product, because otherwise it tends to deviate as as software changes hands over time. Where a Cobalt comes in is and that documentation is right there or here's already a, a pattern that's been established in your code base, right? You can, you can prompt Copilot and say, hey, how do I solve this problem within this code base? Um, and, and it will give you that answer. And if you are <laughs> encouraging and training your engineers to leverage those capabilities, you're going to get a better, more stable, more maintainable product and more, and I would assume uh, more life out of your product over time. Because eventually when these things deviate over time, they're like, oh, it's a mess, it's just easier to rewrite. Mm -hmm. But it's not because the, typically that the technology itself was so bad. It's because the code base specifically has become such a mess, right? Mm -hmm. I uh, can't count how many times I've heard that particular phrase being used. One of the things that, uh, there's actually two things I think that stood out to me as you were talking, one of which is being able to take an existing set of text, be it documentation, be it code, and be able to gather insights on it much more effectively than you could just doing like a plain text search, like a grep, or even running it through something like Lucene to where like something like Lucene or Elastic will tell you, hey, these are all the places that match this text that you gave me, but it's not gonna be able to like synthesize information, you know, and, that, and that's often sometimes <laughs> what we want as large, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen this too, like working on large applications, as they grow over time, as they change over time, it can be difficult to track down all the different pieces of documentation that reference a particular feature. And it's not something you could even do like a plain text search on because it's like it's scattered everywhere. It might be referred to in different ways. So being able to synthesize information in a secure environment, because all the things that you and I work on, they're very proprietary, they're very yes. confidential, they're on a, you know, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you, you know, sort of, sort of basis. Not, not, not literally, you know, just, just sort of figuratively. And one, one of the hesitations that I've seen companies of the size that you and I work with have hesitation about in this technology, if they are going to use it, if they're going to drink the Kool-Aid, so to speak, they're worried about having to divulge over to this third party 
their trade secrets, their proprietary information, their intellectual property. Having your own instance of Microsoft Copilot or something where it's on your tenant, where it's encrypted with keys that you own, and maybe more importantly, that it cannot be used to train subsequent models of a large language model from one of these companies, that I think is gonna be what we're gonna see a lot of in 2024. But I'm curious, you know, since we're all in the prediction business, maybe what are, what are some, uh, some policies or some best practices? Where do you see generative AI disrupting in 2024 and beyond? It's a good question. Um, I was in a meeting in, uh, in my last employer um, when uh, ChatGPT just kind of really hit the market. And we were talking about uh, regulation rules. And we had a whole division or, or team, I would say, devoted to that. And they started arguing about, right, can we do this in the UK? Can we do this in, in different parts of Europe? And I just prompted ChatGPT. <laughs> and like got an immediate answer <laughs> in the middle of the meeting. I was like, oh yeah, we can do that. They were going to take like a week. Um, all that to say where I think ChatGPT can provide the most uh, and other technologies like generative AI can provide the most disruption early on is all these industries where reference and nuance is really important. So rules and regulations across different states or different countries where you need to understand, okay, in this particular country, I need this, right? It's thing, things that tend to kind of, they're all fairly similar, but deviate in certain circumstances, right? I think that's a super simple use case. And where I kind of thought, um, no offense to my previous colleagues, it's like, I don't know that we need a team for this anymore. Because <laughs> I, I, I got the answer in a minute, right? Uh, I just, you know, try to figure out how to ask the right question. Um, I think it's also, um, we were applying it in medicine. So I, I previously worked in med tech and machine learning, applying it to large data sets uh, based off of ethnicity, lifestyle, age, and all of these things and, and started getting predictive on how do we help you live a longer, healthier life, right? That was a really great use case because I was getting, we were looking at models about information about my particular use case. And it's like, okay, these are the things I will typically have to worry about. That's typically information that I would have to get my doctor and only if I prompt him, right? And you're hoping that he has the right experience for my background, right? And right now you can just basically query the, the full the size of the model, right? And, and it's gonna be much more likely to have an understanding of my nuance of my particular health uh, than others, right? Then like I have a, a particular a unique type of asthma where my general practitioner has no experience, right? So he can't tell me certain things, I have to go to a specialist. So that can be trained into the model itself and I can get those answers and, and get feedback faster and, and kind of act on them. So I see medicine for one, I see you know, anything rules and regulations, law as another one. And then industries where they match very closely with rules and regulations. So I'm now in construction, construction tech. All the 50 states have different rules and regulations. Slightly nuanced, almost exactly the same, right? But there's a particular thing you need to know about Louisiana, or there's a particular thing you need to know about building in California. Um, and there's like an extra step. I think those language models would know that very well and know that nuance instead of having to call up, you know, random name Bob and because he's the expert and he would know, right? You can get those answers and built it into your process without even prompting, ideally. That's really cool. The, the, at least from the people that I have talked to that have been in the know, their, uh, their general guidance is don't build in California. Um, <laughs> so a, I can say that because I used to be a former resident of California for two, two and a half years, somewhere around there. So, you know, I have a, I, my card is in the mail. So we, uh, we covered a lot of ground, you know, we shed some tears, had some laughs. I'm curious if there's any other uh, closing thoughts that you want to provide anything else that we should have talked about, but didn't the, I, I yield the remainder of my time to the floor as the kids. Yeah. I, I think the, Understanding 
I think the most important thing, it's it's very common nature just to build a lot of trust when something is, you know, 90% accurate. But ChatGPT and and um, you know Cobot and all these things, uh, all these they have hallucinations all the time. It does not negate the need for an understanding of what the product is providing back to you, right? You must like you are still effectively responsible, right? When I talk to my engineers, like we th just because ChatGPT or Copilot generated code for you does not negate your responsibility of owning that code. You are responsible for it. And I think there's a danger there of people just kind of like reneging responsibility or reneging un understanding of what these products are developing or providing to us because it's so easy and I don't have to think about it. So I think we should have talked about or spent a little bit of talk about an engineer's responsibility for code that's generated for itself and how you interact with it. And, and, and what, is, what does it mean to say, okay, 7% of this code was generated, random number. What's my responsibility for that code shipping into production? And what's my understand, What's my responsibility for understanding that code and making sure I can maintain it without the tool? Spoken as a true director. <laughs> now, Chris, it's been real. Thank you very much for coming onto the show. Appreciate it. It's always good to talk to you, dude. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And ladies and gentlemen, catch you in the future.